Hello, I am Jukka Pekka Humaloja. This talk is about inferring the adjoint turnpike property from the primal turnpike property, and it is joint work with Tim Falvasser, Lars Krune, myself, and Manuel Schaller. I'm not going to include a video of myself talking, but here's a picture of me for some visual reference. Alright, so here's the outline of the talk. First, I'll try to explain what the title means, that is, what's a turnpike property and why is it worth studying. Then we'll go through the actual problem formulation and look into the mathematical background, that's the basis of our analysis. At this point, I'll probably have taken most of the given time already, so we'll just go through the main results very briefly, and if you're interested, you can read the details and proofs from the article. Finally, there's a numerical example at the end to illustrate the results. So, what is the turnpike property? To answer this, let's consider an optimal control problem like this one, where the goal is to minimize a given cost function of the state x and control u, such that the state has some dynamics like this. You can consider this more of an illustration, as I'm not going to go into any details about the functions j and f at this point. Let's just assume that this optimal control problem has at least one optimal solution, which might look like this. So basically, we see that the optimal solution converges to a steady state, which is the turnpike. To get to the turnpike property, let's consider the same optimal control problem on a finite time horizon from 0 to t instead of the infinite horizon we had before. The optimal control problem is said to have the turnpike property if the optimal solutions of the finite horizon problem spend most of the time near the same steady state as the infinite horizon one. So in addition to this entry arc, also a leaving arc is allowed as long as the solution stays most of the time near the turnpike. We'll see a formal definition of the turnpike property later on, but for now I'll leave you with this. Note that this idea of computing the optimal solutions on the infinite horizon by consecutively solving these finite horizon problems is utilized in model predictive control, which is one of the reasons why the turnpike property is important. So I already touched upon this question on why the turnpike property should be studied, and indeed one of the main reasons is its application to model predictive control. Namely, if the OCP has the turnpike property, then a model predictive controller is approximately optimal on the infinite time horizon. There's also the additional benefit regarding numerics, namely, if you solve an optimal control problem numerically, both spatial and temporal discretization errors decay exponentially. There are many cases when an OCP is known to have the turnpike property. For linear ODEs and PDEs, the turnpike property is implied by stabilizability and detectability. In the nonlinear case, similar results can be obtained by linearization arguments, but this also requires making certain smallness assumptions, which is of course a severe limitation. Alternatively, this notion of strict dissipativity of the OCP implies global turnpike, but this is only for the state and control, whereas the above results also provide the adjoint turnpike. Now, I haven't brought up this adjoint state earlier, but it's something related to the necessary optimality conditions of the OCP. We'll see what those are later on. So the starting point of our work is to show that the turnpike property on the state and control, which is the primal turnpike, implies the turnpike property on the adjoint without making smallness assumptions. That is, we assume that the OCP has the primal turnpike and try to show the adjoint turnpike. Okay, now that we have covered the background of the turnpike property, let's move on to the mathematical framework. So the OCP is of this form, the cost function is similar to what we saw before, but now the state has dominantly linear dynamics with the addition of a nonlinear term on the state and control. Here the state space X is a Banach space, and the input space U is a Hilbert space, which can be finite or infinite dimensional. The function J is sufficiently smooth. This A is the generator of a strongly continuous semigroup on X, this B is a bounded linear operator, and the F function is sufficiently smooth. By the pair X bar U bar we denote the optimal solution of the corresponding steady state system, so we just drop everything time dependent compared to the original OCP. The solution of the steady state system is in fact a turnpike, as we'll see on the next slide. So, the text U denotes an optimal solution of the OCP and X bar U bar the corresponding steady state solution. Note that we don't discuss the existence of solutions, but just assume that at least one optimal solution of the OCP exists. Now, let's consider two functions t1 and t2 of the horizon length t. These are non-negative functions with t2 bounded by t1 from below and by t from above. Finally, the difference t2 minus t1 is strictly monotonously increasing and grows unboundedly. Then, the OCP is said to have the primal turn by property for every positive epsilon there exists some positive t not such that the distance between the solution of the OCP and the turnpike x bar u bar is at most epsilon for all time instances on this interval when t is large enough. So this means that if we increase the horizon length t, the solution of the OCP will spend longer time near the solution of the corresponding steady state problem, which is the turnpike. Now that we got the turnpike property also mathematically introduced, we move on to the necessary optimality conditions and the adjoint state. As we have assumed that the pair x u is an optimal solution of the OCP, there necessarily exists an adjoint state lambda which has this dynamics with a constraint. 
Of course, the solution of the OCP still has to satisfy the original dynamics, which is where the last line comes from. Note that the adjoint state has an initial condition at the end of the time horizon, and here's also a minus sign in the dynamics, so the lambda essentially evolves backwards in time. Now, there are also similar necessary optimality conditions for the steady state problem, so if we have the corresponding steady state solution x bar u bar, there is a lambda bar satisfying the corresponding steady state equations. Now that we have introduced the adjoint state lambda and the corresponding steady state lambda bar, we introduce the adjoint turnpike property, which is relatively similar to the primal turnpike property. So, similar to the primal turnpike property, we take these two functions, S1 and S2, such that the difference is strictly monotonously increasing and grows unboundedly. Note that these can be different functions from the primal turnpike property. Now, similar to the primal turnpike property, we say that the adjoint has a turnpike property at lambda bar, if for every positive epsilon there exists some t naught such that lambda stays close to lambda bar for all time instances on this time interval. As in the primal turnpike, this interval grows unboundedly as a function of the horizon length t. However, there's a twist that this norm is now on a Hilbert space y instead of the Banach space x. Of course, if x is finite dimensional, then we can simply choose y to be x, but if x is infinite dimensional, then a suitable choice of y depends on the spaces x and u, and the non functions j and f. We won't go into any details about this here, so you'll have to check the paper for more information. The way we show that the adjoint state has the turnpike property is by deriving these sort of error dynamics based on the necessary optimality conditions. So if we define some remainder terms like this, we get dynamics for the distance from the turnpike like this. Now, this is directly obtained by algebraically manipulating the necessary optimality conditions, and the most interesting thing here are these new operators A and B. Note that these are perturbed versions of the original calligraphic A and B. These remainder terms play less of an important role, since at the primal turnpike x and u approach x bar and u bar, and hence the remainder terms approach zero. Of course, this wouldn't be the case without f and j being sufficiently smooth. So those error dynamics are the basis of our analysis, and we obtained the following results. The primal turnpike implies the adjoint turnpike in the following cases. When the adjoint of a generates an exponential stable semi-group, when the pair a adjoint b adjoint is exactly observable, and when the pair a adjoint b adjoint is exponentially detectable, where the unstable part of a adjoint is finite dimensional. All these results are based on the previously seen dynamics. I won't go into any detail about the proofs, but one important thing to note is that these cases are considered on Y. So in particular, the adjoint of A has to generate a strongly continuous semi-group on Y. Also note that these cases aren't quite as simple as presented here, as there are some additional technical assumptions involved to make the proofs work. You can check this from the article if you're interested. Let's now move on to the numerical example. So we consider a similar heat equation on the unit square, where we have a diffusion term, reaction term, a nonlinear term on the state, and distributed control. The system is governed by the boundary conditions, and the control acts on the upper half of the square. The cost function is just a quadratic function of the state and control, where the target state has been set to 1 on the left-hand side and minus 1 on the right-hand side of the square. The other parameters are shown here as well. We solve the optimal control problem numerically using the C++ library space and the finite element library cascade 7. We verify the turnpike property for the state and control numerically for the state space H1 and the input space L2. Thus, one of our results then implies that the adjoint turnpike holds in L2. This is essentially because H1 is embedded into any LP space, so that we could choose Y to be L2 for any polynomial nonlinearity of the state. Numerically, we see that the adjoint turnpike appears to hold even in the stronger H1 norm, but we don't have a theoretical justification for this. So here you can see the H1 norms of the state and the adjoint and the L2 norm of the control input during the simulation. These indicate that they all reach a steady state relatively quickly and then stay there until the very end of the simulation. This is exactly what is to be expected based on the turnpike property. Here's another figure from the simulation. So we compare the solution of the OCP at the time instance 5 to the solution of the corresponding steady state problem, and you shouldn't be able to see any difference between the dynamic variables here compared to the static variables here. This is because the dynamic solution is at the turnpike at this time instance, meaning that the dynamic variables are arbitrarily close to the corresponding steady state variables. It's time to conclude the talk. So we saw turnpike results for the adjoint state for nonlinear OCPs under the assumption of interval turnpike on state and control. 
While the talk mainly focused on infinite dimensional systems, the results are applicable to finite dimensional systems as well, in which case the theoretical framework is a bit lighter. Of course, in the interest of Thama, I didn't go into all the theoretical details concerning, for example, the non-linearities. The main point of this talk was to give you an idea what the article contains, and in case someone is interested in the technical details, you can go on to read about them yourself. We also have an extended version of the article in archive. Finally, I'd like to come back to the fact that in the numerical example we only verified the primal turnpike property numerically. This is because it's a hard enough real task to verify the global turnpike property for only in a row CPs, and this is of course something we would like to improve on in the future. There's also some other technical stuff that we couldn't get to hold in a very general setting, so that's something to work on in the future as well. Anyway, that's all for now, so thank you for watching.